Today I'm going to take you guys to a new spot over by the bay right over here in South Beach. It's a very cool little area where you can walk behind some of these high rises that are right on the bay and uh, right across from where we're going to be going right now is Star Island, one of the most expensive and fancy islands in all of Miami. I'll show you guys that here in just a minute. But uh, I figured it'd be cool to come to a new spot today that we haven't been to for the videos before. And uh, let's talk about how they want to take away all the affordable housing options. Check this out. We got Star Island right across the bay over there, Port of Miami. Got some marinas over here. So we'll walk over here and uh, we'll also check out this new park that's over this way. Now, does anybody want to take a guess at what the most affordable housing option is in the United States right now? Anyone? Anyone? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's mobile home parks, okay? Mobile home parks are literally the cheapest place that pretty much anyone can live anywhere in the U.S., which is basically the next step to being homeless. And I'm not disparaging anybody who lives in a mobile home park, but what I'm saying is it is the next step up from just living in a tent or in the van down by the river, guys, because it is right now the most affordable option pretty much anywhere you go. Because check this out, in 2021, the average rent for a mobile home was $593, guys. So that is dirt cheap. And I don't know anywhere, anywhere down here in South Florida where you can get a rental of any kind for that price. I mean, we do have some mobile home parks down here, but they are in bad spots, okay? We're talking very nasty looking in ghetto areas. Maybe one of these days I'll drive by and show you what I'm talking about, but I'm definitely not gonna be walking through there. So when you look at the rent for these mobile homes, being on average $593 a month, compared to the average one bedroom rental across the country right now is $1,450 a month, that's basically a third of the price, right? Far less expensive, you get more space, you know, the mobile homes usually at least two bedrooms, and uh, you know, you get somewhat of a yard, some of them even have amenities, things like that. And basically how it works for most people that live in the mobile home parks is you own the trailer or the mobile home, manufactured home, whatever you want to call it, and you rent the land underneath it. And a lot of these mobile home parks will raise the rent between four to six percent annually. And if you're not happy with the rate increases, then you're welcome to just go ahead and pick up your mobile home, move to another park. Okay, there's no problem with that. You're allowed to do that. The problem is most people don't do that because it's completely unaffordable to move one of these things. It's very expensive. And if you're living in the mobile home park to begin with, you probably can't afford to move the mobile home. And as of 2020, nearly 22 million Americans are living in mobile home parks somewhere across the country. So that is quite a bit, guys. That is 6.7% of the entire US population that lives in a mobile home park. What's the biggest problem with these mobile home parks right now? They're being targeted. In fact, they're basically the number one target for institutional investors right now because they see this as a huge opportunity to basically buy up these mobile home parks and so-called improve them, right? And add value and then turn around and raise the rents. But here's the issue. People that live there can't afford these increases. It's a little noisy over here. We got something going on. I don't know what they're doing, but something's happening right here. Hopefully it's not too loud for you guys. Now, the thing about these mobile home parks getting bought up by the institutional investors, they say they buy them to add value and you know raise the rents and bring in a higher income tenant. But the thing is, guys, if you can afford a regular one bedroom, why wouldn't you just go rent that instead of move to a mobile home park? You know, I've never heard of anyone say, oh, you know, I, I would rather move to the mobile home park than you know, the nice apartment downtown. Now, maybe that might be you. I'm just saying I've never heard anyone say that. And, uh, you know, I don't think that would be the case for most people. But somehow the institutional investors think that this strategy is going to work when it comes to making the mobile home parks the next best thing. Like we said earlier about people not being able to afford to move these things if the rent goes up exponentially, it can cost upwards of $10,000 to move one of these mobile homes to a new park. So when you look at someone paying on average 600 bucks a month, 
to live in one of these places, that's more than what it costs for the entire year to pick up and move. And then once you do that, there's no guarantee that where you go next is actually going to be you know, cheap for a long time because you sign a lease just like when you rent an apartment and then in the end, they can raise the rent once again. So you can go through all this time and effort and a lot of money moving one of these mobile homes and in the end, you can end up moving to another park that just ends up raising the rent on you next year. Now, obviously, one of the big reasons that these institutional investors are targeting the mobile homes is because of the opportunity to swoop in and basically raise the rents to the price that people can't afford, which I don't understand that tactic because if you drive everybody out of your, your mobile home park, you know, how are you gonna be actually making more money off of this? A lot of these investors expect to get about a 9% return on investment for buying one of these mobile home parks. So it is all different types of institutional investors who are buying these mobile home parks now. You have big companies like Blackstone, you have other ones like the Carlisle Group, Brookfield, Apollo. I never even heard of half of these guys, but the thing is they're big equity firms and they buy these parks. And even our buddy Warren Buffett, he's involved in this too, guys. So, you know, probably a lot more people who are, you know, big name wealthy investors out there are involved in this one way or another more than you might think. Apparently Warren Buffett's firm owns a company called Clayton Homes and they're the largest manufacturer of mobile homes in the United States and they also operate two of the biggest mobile home lenders which are 21st Mortgage Group and Vanderbilt Mortgage. Now some people might say yeah so what Michael you know they're buying up all these homes it's just let the free market do its work you know this is capitalism you know doing its job basically and yeah there's some legitimate truth to that okay and it's a free country in the United States. So far, there's no rules on you know, how big companies can invest in real estate across the country or anything like that. But at what expense, guys? If this is literally the last step before coming, becoming homeless for a lot of people, how are they going to basically keep up with this? You know, If people come in there and they go from paying $600 a month and raise it to $1,000 a month, are these people going to be able to afford the increases is really what it comes down to. And you have a lot of retirees that live in areas like this, people on fixed incomes, just low income people that literally have nowhere else to go. This is the, the, the cheapest place that they can afford and they're being kicked out guys. So this is what's happening right now in real time. And it's not like this just started today. This has been going on for years, but every time I see a new story come up about this in the news, I have to bring it up because it's literally the last frontier when it comes to affordable housing in the US. And once that's gone, I think there will be no more affordable housing left anywhere, guys. So that's the worrying part about this. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because if you want to join in on the madness, there are actually REITs out there, the Real Estate Investment Trust that are traded on the stock market that you can actually purchase that invest in these places. So if you want to get involved in uh, making sure the rest of America goes homeless, then you can go ahead and invest in REITs like Sun Communities Inc., Legacy Housing Corp., different REITs like this that cater to making sure that people aren't gonna have an affordable place to live anymore. And honestly, I don't see this slowing down anytime soon, guys, because it was determined that prime commercial real estate has outperformed the S&P 500 for a 25 year period. And these mobile home parks are now a chunk of that pie. And what I always tell everyone, if you're gonna live in one of these mobile home parks, you should be looking for one where you can actually own the land that you have your manufactured home parked on, guys because if you own the land, then this can't happen to you. Yes, your property taxes can go up, your maintenance fees can go up if they have you know, a little HOA thing going on, things like that. So you're not completely future-proof when it comes to expenses rising, but it's a whole lot better than having your plot of land rented and you being completely helpless in the event that another institution comes in, buys up your park, and now you're completely out of luck. So think about that before you move into a mobile home park. Here's the next thing that I found really fascinating today, and that is that Zillow and Redfin are 
basically looking like they might be doomed to fail. And the reason for that is very simple. It's because their business model is destined to fail. And why is that? Why are, why are these guys destined to fail? Well, because at the core of it, these guys came out and developed these companies hoping to disrupt the real estate industry, right? Whenever there's a typical sale, you have the buyer, the seller, and the listing agent and the buyer's agent, right? You basically have four core people attached to the transaction most of the time. And the amount of money that's made on a sale typically is 6% of the purchase price of the property. And then that's divided between the seller's agent, and the buyer's agent. Okay, simple enough. Well, Redfin and Zillow thought that they were gonna be able to take a piece of that pie and basically become profitable companies. But it turns out that that's not working out so well for them. We already know that Redfin is in big trouble this year when it comes to their stock prices. Zillow's not doing much better, okay? And part of me is very happy to hear this because I remember when I was a young real estate agent first getting started in the business, I remember when Zillow first came on the scene, okay? And I remember thinking, oh my God, this sucks because now instead of people having to walk into the office and you know deal with us directly, they, they look at things online on this Zillow website and they think they know the market, they think they know everything, they have this zestimate and this is gonna be a disaster. That was my gut instinct when Zillow first came out and sure enough, guys, I was right, okay? Not only did foot traffic slow in the real estate office after Zillow became more of a thing, but it also just made everyone a so-called expert. Now, I'm not saying it's not good for buyers and sellers to do their own homework, but especially in the early days of Zillow's development, the Zestimate was a complete disaster, guys. It is much better today, I will admit that, but when they first got started, the Zestimates were literally all over the place. I used to see valuations sometimes 100 grand higher than what the property was actually worth, and then it plants this ridiculous notion in the mind of sellers that their property is worth you know, 100 grand more than it actually is. I'm gonna take you guys over this brand new park next now that we walked along the bay a little bit here. But here's the interesting thing about this. Now that Zillow and Redfin have been around for quite some time, it turns out that people still wanna deal with another person when it comes to the real estate business and, it, and when it comes to learning about the market or what their home is worth. People are getting tired of relying on sites like this and they would rather work with a seasoned professional in their neighborhood that really knows what's going on. And to me, I'm actually very happy to hear this because you know there's been always this talk about how you know real estate agents will be replaced by this kind of thing one of these days, and it looks like that might not be the case. See, so they have this brand new park right over here. Never been here before. My first time with you guys. So now it's being said that Zillow and Redfin are basically going to have to completely change their business models if they want to survive this coming recession because whatever they tried to do didn't work guys people are basically going back to wanting to work with a real person who really knows the market versus hoping that some algorithm or ai knows better and it turns out time and time again that these algorithms are not as smart as everybody thinks guys just look at open door and how well those algorithms worked out for them okay they relied on algorithms to tell them how much they should pay for houses in different neighborhoods and these guys got completely reamed okay they lost billions of dollars just in the last quarter alone. And these guys, I wouldn't be surprised if they go out of business, you know? So you have all these companies that are, have been relying heavily on technology and AI to further advance them. And it turns out that even in 2023, nothing beats having a person right in front of you that still knows better, okay? and. To me, that gives humanity some hope, if you ask me, guys. I don't want this to turn into Skynet and uh, the Terminator, and it looks like that's the way things are headed if they keep going with all this. So the fact that people are choosing to do business with real people instead of websites like Zillow and Redfin right now, to me, is a good thing. Here's something. You guys see this tower they're building over here? This place is gonna be so tall, guys. I'll put up a rendering for you that if you think these buildings surrounding it are tall, this is nothing. This place is gonna be so massive that the way they're gonna give people views here is they're gonna build even taller than these buildings so the people at the very top of this building still can see the bay and have 
360 views of South Beach. And of course, everything here is gonna be selling in the millions of dollars, so there you go. Here's something for you. According to a survey that was done from Credit Karma, from people's finances in 2022, just shows how financially stuck everyone is, guys. Listen to this. 68% of American adults who were surveyed with this says that their finances either did not improve or stayed the same in 2022. And check this out. The most common financial mistake that was cited by people who took this survey was that they didn't save money. 40% of people said they didn't save money. 35% of them said they fell into some bad habits financially, which are things like not sticking to a budget, overpaying for rent or overpaying for a house. <laughs> there you go, wink, wink. Losing money in the stock market, losing money in cryptocurrency investments, and not contributing to their retirement savings. So basically, all the financial mistakes that people can make, these people make. And it's not a big surprise that their finances, you know, haven't really improved throughout the year. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because I am the kind of person that likes to learn from other people's mistakes. And clearly, when you see people's mistakes like this and you know what they did wrong, all you have to do is not do what they did, guys. You know, being successful financially, I feel like is not nearly as hard as a lot of people make it out to be. But the problem is people just don't do what they know is the right thing to do, you know? People know it's a bad idea to take out the HELOC loan on their house, but they do it anyways. People know it's not smart to have the $1,000 a month car payment, they do it anyways. People know they should be saving money for their future or for a rainy day, but instead, you know, they blow every last dollar and then some. And really this last story was just the perfect example of this. There was this woman that wrote into one of those financial help websites where they give you financial advice based on your problem, kind of like Dave Ramsey's uh, show, things like that, but instead it's just in writing, right? And this lady says that, you know, her and her husband own, own three houses, they live in one of them, two of them are investment properties, but they're carrying about $20,000 in credit card debt because they had some medical problems, but they also like to splurge and spend on nice things like going on luxurious vacations, eating at nice restaurants, and things like this. And the wife no longer works. The husband makes low six figures, maybe like, I don't know, 120 grand a year, something like that, which is still decent money, a lot more than most people make. And so her question was to the financial gurus was, you know, is it okay to carry this $20,000 in credit card debt, even though we're pretty financially well off? You know, my husband makes good money and we have like a $750,000 net worth. Is it okay to carry this $20,000 credit card debt? And to me, this is just the pinnacle of everything we just talked about. You know, even people that on the surface seem to be smart with money that somehow made it to a point in life where they own three homes, which is one they live in and two investment properties, can still be financially stupid with money. And carrying credit card debt, no matter how much money you have, guys, is just stupid, okay? The credit card interest rates are literally the highest interest rates you will pay on any type of loan. And if you make such good money, why wouldn't you be paying these credit cards off each month? Why carry the $20,000 in debt, okay? To me, that just makes no sense. Even if you have the money to pay it off at any moment, it's still, that makes it even dumber, if you ask me, because then you should definitely do that and start saving that money with the interest, okay? But my guess is, even though these people make a lot of money and they have these investment properties and all this, that they still, they probably burn every single penny that they make and then some. These are what you would call the rich people that are paycheck to paycheck, guys. This is their story right now. I like bringing stuff like this up because it's the perfect example of what not to do. You know, these people could easily turn around their lives and their finances and really be in a good position getting rid of that credit card debt and probably getting rid of some of their bad spending habits that led to that to begin with. And I think that's not very hard to do, especially when you're well off like that and it's not like you need the credit card to survive like some people who are struggling right now. So the fact that some people are choosing to do this voluntarily to me is just insanity. So it's good to be aware what everybody else is doing, not fall into their mistakes because if you can learn from someone else's mistakes for free and have a much more prosperous future by learning from them, 
then I think that's a win. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't wanna wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here, and I'll see you over there.